All right, Vectors Part 2. Uh, so this next part of Vectors, it's more the applications of Vectors. Uh, one of the common applications is dot product. So what a dot product is, is if you have two vectors, oops, don't need the symbol because I made it bold. If we take the dot product, and I should probably define our general vectors. V is just going to be V1, V2. And W will be W1, W2. So if you take the dot product of two vectors, what you do is you take the product of the horizontal components, V1 and W1, and the product of the vertical components, W2 and uh, V2 and W2. And then you add them together. All right, I'm just gonna get rid of these dot multiplications so we don't like confuse our regular multiplication with our dot products. So it's the product of the horizontal plus the product of the vertical, that gives us our dot product. So our dot product does not produce another vector, it produces a scalar. It produces a constant value. Learn to spell, Mr. C. All right, so it produces a constant value. Some properties of dot products is that the order doesn't matter, it's commutative. So V times W equals W dot V. So that's going to be true. Something we didn't talk about in the last video, but probably should have, is what's called a zero vector. A zero vector is just a vector that doesn't have any magnitude. Or I'm sorry, its magnitude is zero. That's different than not having any magnitude. Uh, its magnitude is zero. So a zero vector, the representation of that is just a bolded zero. And if you take the dot product of a zero vector and another vector, it just gives you the value zero. Because each component of that would be zero. The zero vector is just zero comma zero. So each component would be zero, so each of these products would be zero. And zero plus zero is zero, last I checked. There is distribution with the dot product if you do u dot V plus W, that gives you U dot V plus U dot W. And if you, it's not really squaring, but if you take the dot product of a vector and itself, if we look at that, it'd be V1 times V1, which is V1 squared, plus V2 plus V2 uh, times V2, which is V2 squared, which is the inside of the magnitude. It's the magnitude squared. And the last, the last property that we have is if you have a scalar, times a dot product, you can either apply the scalar to the first vector or apply the scalar to the second vector. Because that scalar would distribute to each of these products. So it doesn't matter if the C was with the W1 and the W2 or if the C was with the V1 and the V2. All right. Something we can use the dot product for is if we uh, were to try and find the angle between two vectors. So if we had two vectors, say this is vector V, and that's vector w. 
So this one will be W1, W2, this one, V1, V2. So this would be the angle between. And if we take these two vectors, which are just segments with direction, we can take the endpoints there and close it with another vector. Now this other vector would be the result if we took this and added to that vector the opposite of that vector. If we had it over here, we would get the same vector right here and right here. And that vector would be congruent to that one. So this is the opposite of V. That would be negative V. So this is W plus negative V. And we know subtracting, or sorry, adding a negative is the same as subtracting. So that's W minus V. All right. That got a little messy. I'm just going to re-sketch that on this slide. So that means our components would be W1 minus V1, W2 minus V2. So wait a minute. We have all three sides of a triangle, and we're trying to find an angle. Oh, that's law of cosines. And law of cosines, it's that the square of the opposite and the length of that opposite is the magnitude of W minus V is equal to the square of the of each side add together so magnitude of V squared plus magnitude of W squared minus two times the magnitude of each times the cosine of the angle and if we expand this out if we did the magnitude, it's the square root of the sum of the squares of the components. So W1 minus V1 squared is W1 squared minus 2W1 V1 plus V1 squared. And then uh, W2 plus W2 minus V2 squared. So W2 squared minus 2W2 v2 plus v2 squared equals that one, v squared, v1 squared plus v2 squared. And it's under the square root, but the square and the square root undo each other. I hope you guys got that. Plus w1 squared plus w2 squared minus, I'm going to leave this as is. And if we look, look at how much subtracts off. The v1 squared subtracts off with the v1 squared, v2 squared, v2 squared, w1 squared, w1 squared, w2 squared, w2 squared. Those subtract off to zero, leaving us negative 2 w1 v1 minus 2 w2 v2 equals negative 2 uh, magnitude of v and magnitude of w cosine of theta. Oh, look. They all have the negative 2 in common, so the negative 2 would divide off. So now we're left with W1 V1 plus W2 V2 equals magnitude of V, magnitude of W, cosine of theta. So if we can isolate that cosine of theta... Hey, wait a minute. The sum of the products of the components, that's just the dot product. Ah, so the angle between is the dot product of the two vectors divided by the product of their magnitudes. 
Fantastic. <clears throat> now, actually, I didn't want to change slides. So if we have this case, if the dot product is zero, this whole fraction will be zero. So if the dot product is zero, then cosine of theta equals zero. And what's the angle equal when cosine equals to zero? That's right. I don't know why I'm asking you. Nobody's here except me and my cat, and he doesn't understand geometry because he's a cat. So the angle's 90 degrees. If the dot product is zero, then the angle between them is 90 degrees. The vectors are perpendicular. There's actually a special name for perpendicular vectors. It is orthogonal. Orthogonal vectors are just two vectors who form a 90 degree angle. They're perpendicular to each other. All right. Now we can move on to projection vectors. The last part of this. So let's say we had an incline as occur frequently. There's ramps, there's hills. Not everything is flat surfaces. Uh, not even the earth. If you had something resting on that incline, there is a force that is a that is working on that, that's working on us, that's working on everything on Earth, and that force is called gravity. I'm just going to call the gravity vector F. And we know the magnitude of F. If you're working in, uh, in meters in the metric system, it's negative 9.8 meters per second squared. If you're working in the standard English system, it's negative 32 approximately feet per second squared. But that's not exactly how the force applies to this uh, box, this box on the incline. If the box were to move along the incline, it would move either this way or that way. Uh, if it was just gravity affecting, obviously it would be going down. But if someone were pulling it or dragging it, it could be going up. So with this and the force together, or to counteract that, there is another force that's going directly against it. You could think of this as like what friction would do to something working on the plane. But we have these vectors, okay? This is how it would move. So I'm going to call this vector M1. And this is to counteract that movement. So I'm going to call that vector M2. Now, M1 and M2 together, they're always going to be orthogonal. And I could just translate M1 down here. M1 and M2 will always add up to that force vector. Okay, The M1 and the M2 we're going to work with are going to add up to our force vector. What's happening here? is that force, that natural force of gravity, is projecting itself onto the plane that the object is on. So let's talk about that mathematically, not so much physics. So, if we have a vector, I'm just gonna call this vector u. That's bold enough, I don't need that. Okay, I'm gonna call this vector u. I'm not gonna use the components of it, all right? I'm not gonna 
use the components. But let's say we had a second vector that we want to project that vector onto. And that vector can be in any direction except for the direction of view. You're not going to need to project something onto its own direction. Not even like if it's in the opposite direction. So I'm just going to put V here. I'm going to put vector V here. So we have vectors V and U. Now vector V is along this line. If we were to project vector u onto vector v, this, actually, just to illustrate it better, I'm going to make vector v significantly shorter. All right, just to illustrate it better. It's, it's easier to see if it's significantly shorter. When vector u is projected onto vector v, it is how far along this line vector u would go. So we're just kind of truncating it down. That is our projection vector. That is the projection of u onto v, and the notation for that is PROJ for projection. The subscript is what you're projecting onto. So you're projecting onto V vector U. You're projecting U onto V. So that's our projection vector. And this is going to be a right angle here. Every single time, that will always be a right angle. So we have these two components. We have our projection vector, which just for notation's sake, I'm going to just call that W1. And this other part that's perpendicular, that's orthogonal to W1, to bring us to U. I'm going to put it in that direction. So we can say that W1 plus W2 equals U. Those add together. And W1 is our projection vector. And W1 is also in the direction of V. And since it's in the same direction, but it's just got a different magnitude, it's just a scalar multiple of V. So W1 could be C1, uh, C times V. Right? So, we're going to work with that. But we're actually going to work on a new tablet and I'll, I'll keep bringing this back to refer to our picture again, right? So we had vector u is equal to w1 plus w2. And we also had that w1 is c times v. So I'm just going to replace that. So u is equal to c times v. Oops, that's not a good v. Try that again. Oh, what is happening? That was messy. Let's try that again. U equals C times V plus W2. All right. So this is all true because U is equal to those two vectors added together. So... <clears throat> We can use our dot product to multiply both sides of this equation because this is a vector, that's vector u, and this is a vector. It's a scalar times a vector, which is a vector, added to another vector, that's a resultant vector. So we can dot product to both sides of this equation. We can essentially multiply both sides. So I'm going to dot product v, right? So u dot v equals v dot this resultant vector, uh, this big vector. I'm going to leave this side alone, but this one, oh, if we dot product over a sum, it will be the sum of the dot products. That was one of our properties we set. 
So u dot v equals v dot cv plus v dot w2. Wait, v and w2. v was going the same direction as w1, and w1 and w2 were perpendicular, and perpendicular vectors have a dot product of zero. So that's just zero. And this, we can take the C out. So adding zero, that's a non-factor now. And dot producting something by itself is just the magnitude squared we determine. So u dot v equals c times the magnitude of v squared. So c, c is the only thing that we don't know in this, in this whole situation. We would have v, we would have the magnet, uh, we would have u. Those would be the two vectors we're given. So c is the only unknown. So if we isolate c, it's the dot product divided by the magnitude squared. So wait a minute. Our projection vector was w1, and that was just c times v. So our projection vector is you take the vector that you have, that you're projecting onto, and you dot it with your given vector, divide it by the magnitude of v squared, because that's just c. All that is is just c. We just found a, that to be c, and then you multiply it by your vector. So it's a scalar times your vector gives you your new vector. That's how you project it onto it. So if you have gravity and an incline, you can project that gravity onto the incline to figure out how quickly or how slowly it would slide along the incline. Uh, if you're not count, accounting for like friction. All right. Uh, that's it. So have fun, guys. Enjoy.